The subject for tonight's discussion, Is There a Beat Generation? It is a subject of considerable interest on many college campuses, particularly urban universities. It is of literary interest, of interest as a social phenomenon, and some would consider as a symptom of the alienation which many young people experience in trying to adapt to the standards of the problems of our society in this anxious age. We, our first speaker is a man who has been called the spokesman of the Beat Generation, although it is my understanding that he dislikes this title. He is a native of Lowell, Massachusetts, a former student at Columbia University, author of numerous articles and books, including The Town and the City, On the Road, the Subterraneans, and most recently, The Dharma Bums. I am pleased to present Mr. Jack Kerouac. How close? The, the question is very silly because we should be wondering tonight, is there a world? But I could go and talk for five, 10, 20 minutes about is there a world? Because there is really no world. Because sometimes I'm walking on the ground and I see right through the ground. And there is no world. And you'll find out. Sometimes. <clears throat> but they asked me to write an article about the beat generation, and uh, it fits right in with, this, with the question of the dean. It's called the beat generation, and it's a, the article is supposed to be about my relationship of the the beat generation, all that stuff. And it's a very funny article, so I never made a speech, so I'll read it. Okay, this article necessarily will have to be about myself. I'm going all out. That nutty picture of me on the cover of On the Road results from the fact that I had just gotten down from a high mountain where I'd been for two months completely alone. And usually I was in the habit of combing my hair, of course, because you have to get rides on the highway and all that. And you usually want girls to look at you as though you were a man, not a wild beast. No commas yet. <laughs> I'm like Oscar Levin, I gotta hold my heart. <laughs> But my poet friend, Gregory Corso, opened his shirt and took out a silver crucifix that was hanging from a chain and said, wear this and wear it outside your shirt and don't comb your hair. So I spent several days around San Francisco going around with him and others like that to parties, arties, parks, jam sessions, bars, poetry readings, churches. Walking, talking poetry in the streets, walking, talking God in the streets. At one point, a strange gang of hoodlums got mad and said, what rights he got to wear that? And my own gang of musicians and po poets told him to cool it. Why don't you come back in a million years and tell me all about it, Angel? Recently, Ben Hecht said to me on TV, why are you afraid to speak out your mind? What's wrong with this country? Why is everybody afraid of? <laughs> was he talking to me? And all he wanted me to do was speak out my mind against people. He sneeringly brought up Dulles, Eisenhower, the Pope, all kinds of people like that. <laughs> Habitually that he would sneer at with Drew Pearson. Against the world, he wanted, this is his idea of freedom. He calls it freedom. But who knows, my God, but that the universe is not one vast sea of compassion, actually? It's a veritable holy honey beneath all this show of personality and cruelty? In fact, who knows but that it isn't the solitude of the oneness of the essence of everything. Comma. The solitude of the actual oneness of the unbornness of the unborn essence of everything. Comma. Nay, the true pure foreverhood. That big blank potential that can ray forth anything it wants from its pure store. That blazing bliss. Mati Vajra Karuna, the transcendental diamond compassion. This is 2,500 years old. <laughs> Why should I attack what I love out of life? This is deep. Live your lives out? Nah. Love your lives out. And when they come and stone you, at least you won't have a glass house. Just your glassy flesh. 
But that wild eager picture of me on the cover of the book on the road, where I look so beat, goes back much further than 1948, when John Clellan Holmes, author of Gold and the Horn, good book, The Horn, and I was sitting around trying to think up the meaning of the lost generation, subsequent existentialism, and, and uh, I said, you know, John, this is really a beat generation. And he leapt up and said, that's it, that's right. Maybe since I'm supposed to be the spokesman of the beat generation, I am only the originator of the term and around it the term and the generation taking shape. It should be pointed out that all this beat guts, because they're out guts, right? Therefore, it goes back to my ancestors. <laughs> this is silly. This is paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, though. It goes back to my ancestors who were Bretons, who were the most independent group of nobles in all old Europe, and kept fighting Latin France to the last wall. Although a big blonde bosun in the merchant ship snorted when I told him my answers were Bretons in Cornwall, Brittany. Why, we Vikings used to swoop down and steal your nets. All right. Breton, Viking, Irishman, Indian, mad boy. Doesn't make any difference. There is no doubt about the beat generation. At least the core of it. Mighty. Being a swinging group of new American men intent on joy. Irresponsibility? Who wouldn't help a dying man on an empty road? No. And the beat generation goes back to the wild parties my father used to have at home in the 1920s. In the 1930s in New England, that was so fantastically loud, nobody could sleep for blocks around. When the cops come, they always give them a drink. It goes back to the wild and raving childhood of playing the shadow under the windswept trees of New England's lethal autumn. Lethal. Lethal. And the howl of the moon man on the sandbank until we caught him in a tree. He was an older guy of 15. The maniacal laugh of certain neighborhood mad boys and cretins. The furious humor of whole gangs playing basketball till long after dark in the park. Go back to those crazy days before World War II when teenagers drank beer on Friday nights at lake ballrooms and worked off their hangovers playing baseball on Saturday afternoons, followed by a dive in the brook. And our fathers wore straw hats like W.C. Field. It goes back to the completely senseless, senseless babble of the Three Stooges, <laughs> the ravings of the Marx Brothers, the tenderness of Angel Harpo at Harp, too. In fact, here is a poem I've written about Harpo Marx. Harpo, I'll always love you. Oh, Harpo, when did you seem like an angel the last time and play the gray harp of gold? When did you steal the silverware and bug spray the guests? When did your brother find rain in your sunny courtyard? When did you chase your last blonde across the millionaires' lawn with a bait hook on a line protruding from your bicycle? Or when last you powder puffed your white flower face with fish barrel cover? Harpo, who was that lion I saw you with? How did you treat the midget and conk the giant? Harpo, on your recent nightclub appearance in New Orleans, were you old? Were you still chiding with your horn and the cane at your golden belt? Did you still emerge from your pockets another Harpo or screw on new wrists? Was your vow of silence an Indian harp? Because there's a guy in India, you know, plays a harp. He's made a vow of silence, walks around all over India, barefooted, does nothing but play the harp. And showers and showers and possibly music. So, this all goes back to the inky ditties of old cartoons. Felix the cat with the irrational brick. To Laurel and Hardy in the foreign legion. To the golem, horrifying the persecutors of the ghetto. To the quiet sage in the movie about India, unconcerned about the plot, sitting under a tree. <laughs> to the giggling old Tao Chinaman trotting down the sidewalk of old Clark Gable, Shanghai goes back to the holy old Arab warning the hot bloods that Ramadan is near. You have to warn the hot bloods. <laughs> now, since this is a university, we're here to teach, right? Now, I don't think that I can teach anything to any of you any more than you can teach me because the Lord said that the attainment of enlightenment is neither to be considered a high state nor a low state Everybody equally attains it 
Because everybody equally knows, as Allen Ginsberg says, that lightning strikes in the blue sky. See, everybody knows that. Therefore, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I dedicate this poem. <laughs> I dedicate this poem. <laughs> Do I read the poem? No, no. Anyway, you're all out of your minds. And I'm out of my mind. And you're out of your minds. And I'm out of my mind. And doesn't that make it equal? Doesn't that make it like void? But one final poem, that we I have to finish my thing, my doubt. I'll go down and beat your head in. <laughs> Unless you beat my head in. <laughs> this poem, I dedicate to human suffering and human salvation. You're not listening. The poem goes, loves multitudinous. I told you, Alan. You Love's, love's multitudinous boneyard of decay. The spilled milk of heroes. Destruction of silk kerchiefs by dust storm. Caress of heroes blindfolded to posts. Murder victims admitted to this life. Skeletons bartering fingers and joints. The quivering meat of the elephants of kindness being torn apart by vultures. Conceptions of delicate kneecaps. Fear of rats dripping with bacteria. Golgotha cold hope for gold hope. Damp leaves of autumn against the wood of boats. Seahorses delicate imagery of glue. Sentimental, I love you no more. Death by long exposure to defilement. Frightening, ravishing, mysterious beings concealing their sex. Pieces of the Buddha material frozen and sliced microscopically in morgues of the north. It's a, the severed gullets, more in sense. And it's like kissing my kitten in the belly. The softness that the, of the reward that you'll get. Yes, I know. Thank you, Jack Kerouac.